I absolutely agree that our role as Christians and as government is to find ways to protect the vulnerable. The problem is I don't think we've correctly identified who the vulnerable is. The Church of England, um, you know, I'm being careful what I say here, but has become very concerned about the trendy issues of the day. Um, rather than the timeless truths of Christianity, which you know are countercultural and may not make them popular, but is their reason for being there? What is the way back? It's not preaching at people. It's not um, you know trying to tell people that they're wrong. It really has to be about modelling a, a different way. And I do think there's an interest in the answer to that question because some of these woke arguments and some of the culture wars are really about exactly what you said. Why are we here? What is life for? What is the meaning of life? And, you know, as Christians, we believe that we have an answer to that. Uh, but the question is, how do we communicate that in a loving and accessible, but, but um, you know, truthful way? Hello, I'm Glenn from Speak Life. We like to see all things through the lens of Jesus. We're in a series called The Way Back. Is there a way back to Christian faith in our post-Christian moment? We happen to think so. And we're thrilled to have on the line Miriam Cates, MP. And uh, she joins us from... Uh, where, where are you right now, Miriam? I'm in central London in Westminster, just behind the London Eye. Oh, fantastic. Okay, and you are the MP for where? Peniston and Stocksbridge. It's um, north of Sheffield in Yorkshire, which is in the north of, of England. And you grew up as a Yorkshire lass, is that right? Tell, tell, tell me about growing up in the Cates household. Well, I was uh, not a Cates then, that's my yeah. married name. But I, um, yes, yeah, so I grew up in Sheffield. My dad's a, a GP, a, a doctor, family doctor. Um, and, you know, I had a very kind of normal middle class upbringing. My parents are strong Christians, grandparents too. So really uh, very um, blessed with a strong Christian heritage. Um, but yeah, I went to an ordinary school, um, you know, had it's just a very ordinary British middle class upbringing, really, but a very, very happy um, childhood. Um, yeah, based in Sheffield. My parents had moved there just before I was born. So family kind of spread over the country, but uh, proud of my Yorkshire roots. Yeah. And you're part of the 2019 cohort of kind of young MPs, uh, a fresh injection into the Tory party. It's, it's not known for its youth or its vitality usually, is it? Yes, I think we're young relative to the average age of the Conservative Party rather than um, objectively, although um, actually a couple of our MPs elected then were in their early 20s. So yes, very, um, which is obviously very fresh for the for Parliament as a whole. Um, yeah, I mean, it was an incredible election. Obviously, as a Conservative, it was a very uh, happy one. But um, just from the point of view of of really looking at political tides and how political movements across uh, the Western world um, have have occurred over the previous decade. But I think in retrospect, um, it was a demand that has not yet been fulfilled, uh, a demand for people for a return to uh, a kind of politics that puts our country and our families and our communities uh, front and centre that I'm afraid uh, our government has not has not fully fulfilled in the three and a half years since then. Yeah. What do you think people were voting for in 2019? Was it just we're exhausted, please get Brexit done and we don't care what else happens? What, what, what was what was the nation saying? Well, I think that was certainly a factor and people were fed up of the political turmoil and the what seemed like navel gazing in Parliament and just wanted it over. Whether people had voted for Brexit or not, they wanted it done. So I do think that was a factor. But if you look at some of the, the voting trends and the polling trends, actually the shift uh, of um, people kind of from working class in post-industrial towns, traditional Labour left-wing voters starting to move to uh, the Conservative Party in this country, or you know, you look in the states, the Republican Party, or to uh, populist parties uh, in 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 Europe. That started in the in the 2010s, really. Um, and you know, we saw in the 2015 election here in, in the UK, UKIP, which the UK Independence Party, which was our kind of populist uh, right wing party, got uh, four million votes. I think. I mean, astonishing. Uh, obviously, because of our political system, they didn't win any seats. Mm. Um, but you know, that that shift that tide uh, is, is still going and you're, we're looking at you know voting in Spain and France and Sweden and in the US uh, people's political allegiances have been shifting uh, for 15 years now and that continues so I think that was a big part of it um, in, in 2019. So culturally what are the trends that are going on that, that mean people are not feeling heard? Uh, you, you mentioned a couple of social issues which, which really weren't sort of to the fore of politics if you go back before the 2010s yes. we, were, we were just talking about sort of interest rates and economic policy and, and, and yes. that, that sort of thing. What are the social issues that people are, are becoming concerned with? Yes, and it's interesting, isn't it, that people, um, 
kind of downplay these issues as it's just the culture war, as if culture is something to be put on the side and we can get to speaking about it if we can get through our economic agenda. Whereas, of course, culture is about most people's experience of everyday life. I mean, of course, economics is important, but, you know, cultural security is, is everything for most people. Um, and, you know, yeah, politicians have become used to only talking about the economy. But, you know, some of these issues about cultural security. So in this country, immigration and immigration being perceived as too high is number one on so many people's um, issues uh, when they're polled, especially people in who are, would consider themselves working class or in ex-industrial areas, um, because it's about cultural security. And, you know, I don't think Obviously, there are some people who are racist, but I think the vast majority, it's not about racism. It's not about not being welcoming. It's about wanting that security of knowing that there are jobs for you and your children in your home area, that you can prosper, that you're not competing uh, for those jobs, that the, the wages are not being depressed by uh, high levels of immigration. And I think the, the dramatic social and demographic change that we've seen, that's just been far too fast. Um, and has felt out of control is what make people feel insecure and therefore vote for something that's more along the lines of, of security. It's interesting we've gotten on to immigration. Um, I spoke about immigration a little bit with Tim Farron, uh, a liberal Democrat and a Christian, and uh, he speaks very highly of you, and I know you, you, you do him. And so you're both Christians in different political parties in the UK, and you probably come at the question of immigration from, from different angles. And I, I wonder if standing above not only Christians in the West, but also like everybody in the West, is Christianity and the story of the Good Samaritan, right? In so many ways, you can describe uh, our modern Western liberal sensibilities as basically, you do not walk on the other side of the road. When the guy is beaten up, um, you want to be more like the Good Samaritan. And the Samaritan was, was a, an opposing nation, different religion, and yet he is a neighbor to the guy who is beaten up and we want to be the sort of society that doesn't walk on by but that acts mm. like the good samaritan now that will lead uh, a tim farron i guess in one direction on on immigration can you can you paint me a, a christian picture of why you want to narrow limit immigration in the uk at the moment and and still keep your christian credentials for us all miriam OK, so I'm not a theologian, so no doubt you'll be inundated with um, <laughs> questions and complaints about what I'm about to say. But when I read the teachings of Jesus, when I read the New Testament, I think he's speaking to individual human hearts. And I think the kingdom of God is built on human hearts and is about our, our obedience and our surrender to him. And when he says, love your neighbour, and when he says, forgive, you know, 70 times, I think he's talking to me and you as individuals. That is our attitude to one another, because that's Christ's attitude to us. I don't think he's talking to governments. And I don't think governments are moral agents in the same way that individuals are. I think they're a structure, for good or ill, uh, that's, you know, sometimes uh, we have good and sometimes bad governments, but government organisation, order is always better than chaos. And is, is Jesus saying to governments, don't have a justice system because you should forgive uh, and release every single criminal. No, I don't think so. Is he saying, you know, don't have, um, you know, don't have a national culture because you should let it be diluted with, with other culture? I don't, you know, I don't see that because Jesus, okay, he didn't speak about it much, but he lived in, you know, the, um, the, the Palestinian culture of the time, first century was very ordered, had very strong boundaries, very strong cultural history based on obviously the Mosaic law. And Jesus didn't comment on that. In fact, he said he came to fulfill that law and not a single letter of it should be taken away so i take that to mean that actually strong strong government that creates safety for the people within its care its citizens is actually a, a biblical thing now i'm more than willing to be challenged on that because as i said i am not a theologian but when jesus says those things to us the kind of sacrificial behavior that he requires of us i think that's to us as individuals rather than a comment on how political uh, organizations should behave yeah. um so personally, I think we are far more able as a nation to be able to help the weak, uh, to be able to um, be generous and, and loving if we have a strong core, if we have a sense of who we are, if we are, you know, if we have peace within ourselves uh, and if we can, you know, can... Um, 
be proud of our own culture and heritage. I think, you know, being a nation is a biblical principle. I mean, God created the first nation, the nation of Israel. So, um, you know, I don't, there is no conflict in my mind over those two, two ways of looking at it. Yes. I, it's, it's often a debate about who is the Good Samaritan and who fulfills yes. the role of the Good Samaritan. And of course, theologically, the, the one from outside the system who raises us up is Christ himself. He, he is the one who has loved us um, as, as the true neighbor and set us on our feet. And now he says to us, go and do likewise. But then who is the us? So who is the us? politically... Is it us as individual disciples? Right. Or is he talking to, you know, structures of state? Yes. Would you go, you wouldn't go so far as, as uh, Margaret Thatcher, would you, in saying there's no such thing as society, there's only individuals. Is, 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 there, there is social care. Well, we are woven together with this sort of social fabric, aren't we? I think she was, uh, she has been widely misquoted, or at least what she intended. I, I don't believe that at all. We absolutely, everything, society is everything. You know, our relationships with each other, uh, within communities, the relationships of communities with each other to create a nation is everything. You know, they, relationship is a very biblical principle and it is, it's everything. But I think the problem that we've got into, uh, certainly in, in, in British culture in recent years, is that to substitute those relationships with the state. I mean, interestingly, Margaret Thatcher did say um, about the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan had to be a person of means or he could never have like, helped the guy by the side of the road. And my instant re reaction to what she said was to flinch back and go, oh, yikes. But th there is something about in order to be compassionate, um, you, you must not race to be the victim you must not like competitive victimhood actually yeah. absolutely destroys the parable of the good samaritan because <laughs> then you've got no one to be the samaritan you've got everyone trying to be the guy by the side of the road and so there, there is a sense i guess at an individual level and, and perhaps at a societal level where you've got to have a certain strength in order to provide the mercy and the compassion that we all love would you would you agree with that Exactly. You have to have a strong and sa stable centre, if you like, mm. um, you know, a strong and stable majority in order to be able to look after properly the people who are on the edges, the people who are marginalised, the people who have fallen on hard times. If you haven't got that, that strong centre, you don't have the means and the resources to do that. And, you know, I think the mistake that we've, we've made and we make in our personal lives, in, you know, as well as, um, as governments is, um, that we think that compassion is giving people what they want now rather than taking a long term view of, you know, um, what, what's in our best interest in the future. And, you know, look at, for example, I, our government in the UK's response to COVID. We borrowed four hundred uh, billion pounds. We printed it. It's debt. Um, in order to give people money um, to stay at home and so that we could lock down. Well, now we've got this awful inflationary crisis. Uh, the Bank of England, our central banks, putting up interest rates. Mortgage holders are facing unaffordable mortgage rises because of the decision to print money because it was in our immediate best interest. Now, you know, I think you know, of course, all different cultures have struggles. But I think one of the um, errors of modern times is to think that compassion means giving people what they want now. And I think you can, rather than wanting what's best for them in the long term, and I think you can, you know, extrapolate this to the argument about 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 gender identity, because, you know, people are saying, well, the, you have to have compassion on a child who expresses distress with their biological sex. Of course, you should have compassion on them. Does that mean you should um, uh, agree to their request to suddenly be treated as another gender? No. No, because that's not in their best interest. You know, compassion is sometimes saying no to something that someone genuinely wants because you want what's best for their future. And immigration's a bit like that. You know, do we have to say no to some of the hundreds of thousands of people who want to come here because we will not be able to continue to have the kind of prosperity and stability that will make us the kind of country that can be a safe haven in the future. Well, you know, that's a political mm -hmm. argument, isn't it? Yeah. So I've, I've written a book called The Air We Breathe that talks about the Christian values that we have kind of imbibed from the Jesus Revolution, aka Christianity. And one of the points I've been thinking about since I wrote that book is that the fruit of the kingdom is things like equality, compassion, consent, enlightenment, science, freedom, and progress. And at a cultural level, we have these as values now, but what they've become, instead of being the fruit of the kingdom or cultural values, they become sort of slogans, really. Mm. Um, slogans of, and, and it's it's one thing to use the slogan of compassion, it's another thing to actually be compassionate. I was I was walking my, my daughter to school the other day, and there was a slug crawling up across the pavement. She's eight years old. She says, 
Daddy, save the slug from from it getting you know stepped yeah. on by the next people. And I, I I like to you know get my children to do whatever they can do for themselves. And so I said, Ruby, why don't you save the slug? She said, Ew, it's disgusting. <laughs> I was like, Well, we're in a we're in a dilemma, aren't we, Ruby? You have this compassionate yeah. impulse, <laughs> but yeah. you don't want to get your hands dirty and actually. And and it was it was a lovely little vignette about. Compassion is a slogan versus what it actually takes to yeah. give long-term, you know, care and support for people. But, I mean, you, you as a Christian, uh, you, you love the fact that the Old Testament says we are to look after the orphan and the widow and the sojourner or the alien, the, the, the foreigner who comes in our midst. Um, you, you want to honor those sorts of verses, don't you? Absolutely. And I think you know, there is this big question, who, who are the vulnerable? Um, and in the UK, we have this big piece of legislation that was passed in uh, 2010 called the Equality Act. And it separates people into nine different what's called protected characteristics, uh, as a result of which you can't be discriminated, you know, because of that characteristic. So they are age, sex, um, religion, race, disability, maternity, can't remember the other two off the top of my head. And so basically saying you are vulnerable if you have one of these characteristics and this law is there to protect you from discrimination. Great. I mean, who would disagree with that? The trouble is that, um, you know, there are some you know, adults to some extent ought to have responsibility for their own action. They do in law. I mean, that's unquestionable. Um, so how, how much are we willing to say that adults uh, should be protected in all circumstances or actually are the truly vulnerable, the widows, the orphans and, and the, the, the refugees fleeing from, you know, from persecution. And I think in pitting people's different rights against each other, which we have done in Western society, we've forgotten who the truly vulnerable are. And, and my greatest concern is for children, because I think that uh, at the moment, children are being, you know, in, in giving children rights, you're almost denying them the right to be protected by adults. Um, and I think that's what's gone very wrong in, in our schools. And, you know, I see similar things in the US. So I absolutely agree that our role as Christians and as government is to find ways to protect the vulnerable. The problem is, I don't think we've correctly identified who the vulnerable is. Yes, and that comes across in your national conservatism speech that you gave, was it last month or end of May, I guess it was, yeah, last um, where you majored on, you, you said the, the biggest issue facing us uh, together as a culture is this population crisis. Uh, we're not having enough kids. We're, we're nowhere near replacement rates. And it, it's difficult to imagine Britain getting to the stage where we were at, at replacement rate of sort of 2.1 children. Um, so what what was the journey that led you to identify that as as this key thing that you you wanted to address well i think family is one of the things that i you know work on a lot in parliament family policy how to make life better for families and um i think i've just become very aware that across all of western society birth rates have fallen quite substantially um i you know read various things on it and um just started to to study it in more detail really and look at um the different patterns that have emerged which partly are about family size people have fewer children but actually what's most noticeable is the number of women and we have to count women because it's obviously you know we look at directly how many children women have that's how we measure the fertility rates but the number of women who who are now ending up childless mm. despite saying that they would like to have a child of course there's always a proportion of population male and female who don't want children and that mm. seems to be fairly static over time mm. but the number of women now ending up not having children far exceeds the number who say they don't want to yes. so we've got this gap between people who want children and people who end up having children now people don't want to have children you know that or can't have children or for whatever reason it it doesn't it doesn't work out i mean that's absolutely to be expected and respected in all societies but we do have a, an issue if a large number of women are basically not you know being able to do a very precious thing which is to have and, and bring up your own child so i think government should have a role in looking at what are the barriers that are stopping people from having children um and i think there are a huge number and some of them are common across all western societies some of them are unique to different um, societies and I think sometimes our idea of what encourages people to have children is just completely wrong so for example it's common particularly for people on the left to say we need free childcare from birth so women can get back to work well you know there's 
that's an appealing argument in some ways, but you look at the countries who've done it. So, for example, Finland, they've got the lowest birth rate in almost all of Europe. Uh, and yet they have very high quality, like very cheap. like 1.3 or something, isn't it, in Finland? 1.3, 1.3. Wow. So, you know, they are facing population collapse. And, yeah. you know, I visited there earlier in the year and even at government level, they are talking about what are we going to do? Because we, you know, we're so proud of our public services, but we've got to be honest, in a few years, there's going to be no one to pay tax to, uh, to support them. So, you know, this is a conundrum that all Western countries face. And we've either got to say, well, we're going to have to find a way, way to deal with collapsing birth rates and inverted population pyramid and what that means for us economically. And, you know, that is quite frightening. Or we need to look at ways of encouraging people to have the family size that they actually want. Not about making people have children when they don't want them, but to actually have that, um, you know, have the number of children that they that they say that they want. So I think that should be quite an important role for government because I think that one of the reasons that people aren't having children is a direct result of some government policies, like, for example, a taxation system that penalises families, you know, that those kind of things that make family life more expensive than it needs to be. Housing policy, I mean, young people just can't buy houses anymore. It's a, you know, settling down and buying a first house is often precedes having a child that doesn't happen anymore so i do think it's a legitimate role for government to look at what their what barriers there are uh, to helping people have children and also to be honest about how much we need children from an economic point of view um and therefore you know if we were facing a collapse in our health system or something like that we'd be urgently looking at it so why don't we urgently look at this okay very good let me let me push back in in two different ways and and uh, hear your responses to this. I mean, one answer would be um, someone might say they'd just go back to our earlier part of the conversation and they'd say, oh, population collapse, open the borders. <laughs> Plenty of people want to come in. Um, that's, let's, what, what, yeah. Answer, well, answer me it, on that it, question. It's a, it's a um, you know, that's a commonly repeated argument, but uh, birth rate um, drops are happening across the world. So only 3% of the world's population now live in a country where birth rates aren't declining. Mm. Even in countries in Africa and Asia, which traditionally have had huge um, birth rates, rapid drops. Um, so the idea that countries, you know, countries in the world are going to have the kind of spare young population to send over here in, in, in future is, is not true. You know, it's just mm. that, that stream, if you like, is going to dry up. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, immigrate, immigrants get old, just like, you know, people who are already here. Um, and after at least, after about one generation, there doesn't seem that the birth rate amongst immigrant uh, communities tends to uh, drop down to the kind of national average level. So, you know, immigrants get old, you then need more immigrants. So what you, to have a stable population, uh, what you need is one baby for every 50 year old, really. So that by the time the 50 year old reaches retirement age, the baby has entered the workplace, if you like. So bringing in people in their 20s, 30s and 40s does not help that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and you just end up with this kind of circular system of we've got more people, we need more immigrants, we've got more people, we need more. So it's not, it is not a long term solution. I mean, there are labour market, obviously, arguments for particular shortage sectors, of course, but it, it doesn't solve our birth rate issue. Okay, good answer. Second, second challenge to you, Miriam Cates, is um, earlier you were talking about um, whether whether we need a larger state sort of thing, and whether whether it is the state's role to be the good Samaritan and that sort of thing. And, and Jesus addresses the personal and and the private individual and and strengthens us. Um, great, but then when it comes to the issue of birth rates. Um, does the government really have much of a, a role? Can can government do very much at all? I mean, it, it, it feels like on one, on the one hand you're saying smaller states, on the other hand you're saying that the state is um, can play a part in answering this this chief error of our times. And I, I just wonder how much can government actually do to get? Well, I think the role yeah. of sorry. No, go. No, I think the role of government is to create the conditions that enable people to form those relationships between individuals, families and communities that make people happy, safe and free. Yeah. Uh, it's government's role to create those conditions. How big the state ends up being, to, in my mind, is neither here nor there. That That's its job. Yeah. Um, and for example, you know, obviously you'll hear lots of conservatives argue a bit against high taxation and things like that. And, you know, I don't particularly have an ideological position on it. It should be as high as it needs to be. But, you know, the way that taxes work, the way that taxes collected is not neutral. Uh, it favours one form at the moment of household over another because of the way we tax people. It favours single people over 
families. Now, that's not neutral. I'm not saying that the government should necessarily favour families over single people, but it should at least be neutral. You should at least not be worse off by forming a family and having children. I mean, that doesn't yep. make sense. And at the moment, our, a lot of our policies, our economic policies and our social policies are not neutral. They're actually anti-family. And so as a start, I think the state ought to have policies that make it possible and affordable to form a family and have children. That seems a fairly small ask. It's not an interventionist one at all. It's just about not yes. being against the family. Yes. Do you think we look to the government more than we ought to in order to solve the, the, the deeper existential crises we have. You know, I, I often sort of hear people talk about, I don't know, like if, if people even talk about something like obesity or, or that kind of thing, and then like the only policy or the, the only ad addressing of that one issue that people can even dream of is a sugar tax. I know, let's have the sweetest tax of all. And that will say, and it, it seems to me like there are some deeper existential issues. And with the birth rate, I mean, it's one of the yeah. most existential issues because you're, you're voting on the future. <laughs> is there a future that's mm. worth it? Is pain and suffering worth it? What is life worth in the here mm. and now? And I, I wonder if people are looking to government to answer that question when, when really that's above its pay grade. Yes, I think people are looking to the government to solve more and more problems and COVID exacerbated the dependence on the government because of the way the government behaved, which was to try and solve everybody's problems, to try and hand out billions of of pounds and ultimately to say that, you know, it's our job to prevent people dying. Well, you know, yes, of course, security and general health policy are the government's role, but you can't, you know, governments can't stop old people dying. Yeah, that, that is not within yet uh, the remit, the remit of, of government. And so, you know, we have looked too much to the government to solve our problems. But that is completely inevitable be, uh, when you've had seen, you know, the decimation of families and communities, which we have seen in this country. You know, family break, we have the highest family breakdown rate in the West, in, wow. in the UK. And there's so many of our issues that flow out of that, whether it's, uh, you know, it's children struggling at school, pressure on the health service, housing, flow out of broken families and broken relationships and the tragedies that come out of that. And so, of course, if you then don't have that solid family to look after you in your time of need, who do you look to? Yeah. The government. Yeah. Um, and so we've got into this cycle of, you know, we've got a problem. And now we've, we've hit this mortgage rate crisis, as I mentioned earlier, and people are crying out to the government give us money to pay our mortgages and you think well there's you know that's the logical conclusion of all this and yet the more the government messes in the markets and the interest rates and everything like that the worse it's, it's going to get probably so we need to get out of that cycle but i favor a bottom-up approach rebuild families and communities rather than cut the size of the state so if you just cut the size of the state who's going to meet that demand which is very real um you know we've got to we've got to reduce the demand on the state and then potentially you can cut the size of the state but it has to be that way around yeah so i mean a character caricature of left and right is to, to see a societal problem and the left just says the state will fix it and the right says well the individual through the market will fix it and and they in that caricature the great danger is an idolatry of the state on the one hand and an idolatry mm -hmm. of the market on the other hand and what it seems to me from a christian point of view is what about the church mm -hmm. <laughs> what about what about uh, a society of persons within society that can have a leavening effect on the rest of, of, of the nation? Um, and putting your Christian hat on for a bit, Miriam, um, what would you like to see the church saying and, and proclaiming into a culture that has this, you know, this birth rate collapse that doesn't seem to be have a hope for the future? There's a relational breakdown, a family breakdown. What, what can the church say into these times? Yeah, well, I think, what is the role of the church? I mean, in former times, before the welfare state, the church was, or at least part of, the welfare state, and that gave it a reason um, to engage with people in their lives, which I don't think necessarily exists now. And, you know, of course, the welfare state is absolutely brilliant in so many ways, but it has, it has taken the um, service of church groups, community groups, you know, the need for that service away to, to a greater or lesser extent, which has reduced their ability to get involved, I think. But uh, although we did see a lot of that in COVID, which was great. Um, I mean, what's the role of the church to kind of look after its own flock and to make disciples? And, um, you know, I suppose one of the frustrations that I have as a politician is that 
are because we have this connection of the church and the state in this country you know the church of england is uh, intimately entwined with our constitution and with our government we saw that to great effect in the coronation for example and that was you know a, a brilliant event but uh, some of our church leaders, shall we say, have got very involved in, in p- politics and are very political. And they sit in the House of Lords. They're part of our government, some of our bishops. Um, and sometimes my frustration is that they just add more voices to the political fray rather than the kind of cu- countercultural truth, hopefully, truth um, pointing narrative that y- you'd hope the, the church to have. Um, and, you know, the Church of England, um, you know, I'm being careful what I say here, but has become very concerned about the trendy issues of the day um, rather than the timeless truths of Christianity, which, you know, are countercultural and may not make them popular, but is their reason for being there. And that is hugely frustrating when our national uh, faith leaders um, kind of play into the the modern culture rather than standing back from it. But you know maybe that's a personal gripe. But there are some great churches here in the UK doing some absolutely brilliant things. Um, but you know the latest census shows that the number of actually practicing, practicing Christians is is very low. You know it's falling. And um, so we we have a challenge. And I think you um, said at the beginning, um, you know what is what is the way back? And it's not preaching at people. It's not. Um, you know, trying to tell people that they're wrong. It really has to be about modelling a, a different way. And I do think there's a, a, there's an interest in the answer to that question because some of these woke arguments and some of the culture wars are really about exactly what you said. Why are we here? What is life for? What is the meaning of life? And, you know, as Christians, we believe that we have an answer to that. Uh, but the question is how do we communicate that in a loving and accessible but, but um, you know, truthful way? Are you seeing signs of hope? Well, let's, let's finish with this question. Are you, are you seeing signs of hope that, People are discovering a way back to Christian faith. I mean, from one point of view, you're a Christian in the workplace. Your workplace happens to be Westminster. Um, You're living out there in the world. You're seeing people asking existential questions. Are you seeing a spiritual hunger, do you think? Um, I suppose I don't think I personally have seen that. We've had, from a political point of view, we've had some interesting developments so i don't know if you following the followed the scottish leadership election yeah. uh, earlier this year kate forbes who's you know practicing christian and was challenged very robustly on some of her more you know what people would call traditional views although she didn't win she got a phenomenal share of the vote far above what people said she'd get because they thought that her views would be too unacceptable so that that was interesting and it's certainly i think there have been more fa- more conversations about pa- faith in the public sphere since then uh which is very interesting but um you know no i i don't i, I do think it feels like quite a hard a hard time in the west to to be um a christian but then it probably always has been because you know it is it is countercultural it's not it's not easy um looking at the stats i mean church attendance continues to fall apart from there are some churches that are very much growing and very much growing with young people so there is that you know it's the church is alive and well here but it's it's not at the fore of public life Yes, yeah. I often have a table mountain view of Christianity, where it's sort of this plateau. It sort of went up in 312 AD with Constantine. It it uh, was flat until about 1963, when it all sort of dropped off a cliff, and and now you know we we are uh, in the valley, and it's just not the case at all. It's you know sometimes the yeah. church has been had cultural clout and been hated, and sometimes it has been on the margins and it has been admired, and it has ever been thus. Yeah. And so we we just go out and we preach that same Jesus. Uh, to the culture and uh, yeah I'm, I'm just so grateful that you're there in Westminster uh, Miriam and uh, so grateful for lots of the different stands that you've made um, I'll send you a link to one of the other videos we've made which is a comment on your speech back at the the gender recognition stuff um, oh. that was back in back in February but um, yeah we've been we've been following you and uh, cheering you on uh, in terms of uh, here's a Christian sister uh, standing up in politics so thank you very much Miriam Gates thank you great to meet you 